Hello everyone. In this video, we'll learn how to use the matrix to find all the rows in a 12-tone composition. As our sample piece, we'll use an excerpt from the piano work we've been looking at in the first three videos, written by the Italian composer Luigi Dalla Piccola in the early 1950s. So let's dig in. Okay, let's take a listen to this excerpt. As we look at the score and the matrix here side by side, we can then use the matrix to identify the various tone rows and how they are presented both melodically and harmonically. If you watched video one, you already saw how we found the initial row presentation, or P0. As a reminder, the first sounding pitch will usually be the first note in the P0 row. Exceptions to that are in a melody accompaniment style piece. Often the accompaniment will come in early and then the P0 row will be in the melody that follows it. Also there are sometimes situations in which there is a chord that starts a piece and we have no way of knowing the order of the notes because they happen simultaneously. In those situations we have to wait for a later single line presentation of that row where the notes are presented in succession to determine the correct order of the notes. Lastly, when we're dealing with a piece that is part of a larger collection, we will often have to go back to the initial piece in that collection to find the P0 row. Such is actually the case with this Dallapicula piano piece, as it is part of a larger collection. But for our purposes, we treat it here as a standalone composition. And as a reminder from video one, we found the P0 row here by taking the first sounding pitch B flat and then moving to the right, considering all the notes in all the staves, and then looking for the other 11 pitch classes uh, in some kind of order without any pitch class repetition. Now, as a reminder though, sometimes notes are repeated like here, but as long as there's no intervening note, um, this is a common practice. So we start on B flat and we look for all of our notes and my first thought was B flat A and then come down here and then you have G, C, B flat. Well, then we have a repeated B flat before we get to 12 notes. So these, uh, these notes are probably not part of this row. And what we eventually found out was that the row was these top notes uh, over here. So this is our P0 row. So B flat is note number one. A is note number two, and F is three, D is four, C is five, F sharp is six, G is seven, D sharp is eight, then there's a repeated D sharp, but that's okay. C sharp is nine, G sharp is 10, B is 11, and that's a low E, which is 12. Okay, so that takes care of all of the notes on the top staff. So then we are stuck now with this chord, which has four notes happening simultaneously. So there's no way for us to know which one is the first one in the row, but we're pretty sure this is going to be a row. So what we have to do then is try each of these notes one at a time to see if they are the first note in a row. And since the rows always start on the outer edge of the box, we can try each of these notes 
and see if the other three notes are in the next three slots. So if we start on E flat, we'll find all the E flats on the edge of the box and then see if there's a C, G, B flat immediately following. So we can start up here. We have an E flat, which is the same as D sharp, and we're looking for C, G, B flat in the next three boxes. We don't have that. So we come here to E flat, here we do have a C, G, B flat, so that looks promising. And if that's the case, then the fifth note in our row would be D. So if we take these four notes, we're looking for a D to be note number five, and we don't get that here. We do get a D here in close proximity, and sometimes composers do share notes with rows and overlap them. But in this case, this note happens after these, so this is not a possibility besides the fact that the next note would have been F sharp, which is nowhere in here. So this is not uh, the answer. So we come down here and we look for E flat. We don't see a C, G, B flat. And then we come to E flat here. We don't see a C, G, B flat. So E flat's not the first note of these four. So we'll try B flat, and then we're going to look for C, E flat, G following. So let's try all the B flats. Here's a B flat. We don't see a C, E flat, G following, and we don't see it here. And the other B flats down here, we don't see C, E flat, G there or there. When a note is in the corner, that means that there is only going to be two of them because it, it, um, it works for that direction and that direction. So there's one on each corner, and then if you go to the other corner, there will be one of those on the other side. Well, B flat doesn't work out. So then we're going to try C and then see if there's an E flat, G, B flat in the next three slots in any kind of order. So we look for a C and we're looking for an E flat, G, B flat. No. Here's a C, E flat, G, B flat. No. Here's a C, E flat, G, B flat. No. Here's a C, E flat, G, B flat, no. So then we'll go to G and we're going to look for C, E flat, B flat. So we're finding our G's and we're looking for C, E flat, B flat almost, but no. G, C, E flat, B flat, no. G, C, E flat, B flat. Okay, this looks promising. C, E flat, B flat, and then the next note, G sharp, would follow in the fifth position, which is there. So this looks good. So this is probably going to be R, I, 3. And then note number one is G, note number two is C, note number three is D sharp, note number four is A sharp or B flat. Note number five is G sharp. Note number six is E. This B flat is a tie, um, so that doesn't need to be counted twice. And then F is seven, B is eight, A is nine, F sharp is ten, D is eleven, C sharp is twelve. And that gives us a leftover note here of E sharp and all the other notes in the top system are accounted for. So we're going to look for the note E sharp or F and see if we can find these four notes in the next four slots since they're the next four notes that happened in time. So F followed by C, E, G, A. So let's look at our Fs. We don't see a C, E, G, A here. We find an F on this side, C, E, G, A, almost, but no. Down here, C, E, G, A, no. And here, C, E, G, A, there we go. Um, and then the fifth note, um, the sixth note would be C sharp following. So is there a C sharp following these? The next note is either F sharp or D sharp. There's really not a C sharp around here to justify that. So that actually is a little bit frustrating. So sometimes these notes are kind of leftover notes 
and uh, we're not sure how to deal with them and you get into a, a situation where you don't know what to do so what we're going to do then is skip it for now and go over to the high F sharp in the second system and since this composer presented the initial row in melodic fashion with an accompaniment row I'm wondering if he's going to do that on the second system so I'm going to check this section up here so I'm looking for F sharp B followed by E or F sharp B followed by D so here's an F sharp G B no F sharp C sharp A sharp no F sharp B D A F sharp B D A so looks like this is going to be a row so if we look at I2 um, sorry, RI2. We start on F sharp, B, and then we go to D, A, G, E flat or D sharp, and E would be the next note, and then B flat. This is a repeated E, that's okay, with no intervening pitch. We go down to B flat or A sharp, A flat, F. C sharp or D flat, and then C is note number 12 um, or B sharp. At this point, we have to figure out what to do with this E sharp, and we've already discovered that there's no F followed by these four notes anywhere in the matrix. And this actually stumped me for quite a while until I figured out that Dallo Piccola was using this E sharp as a continuation of this F in the RI3 row and not introducing a new pitch. It's merely a repetition of ordinal 7 within the row. And once I figured that out, that opened everything up so that I can now come down here and start working on the last notes in this system. So. As I then look down here at these four notes, I'm looking at C, E, G, A, and I'm going to look for C, E, G, A over here in any order. So I can go around and look for all the C's and look for E, G, A, and then I can look for all the E's and look for the other three notes and go through and look for all the G's and A's and look for the other three notes and like we did before. Um, but just to save you a little bit of time, I'll tell you it only happens twice. Um, here C E G A and we have one here C E G A now if we choose this one C E G A then our fifth note would be F so we would have to have an F next so C E G A followed by F well, we don't have that we actually are looking for D sharp or E flat so if we look at this one C E G A B we have the same problem. We're looking for D sharp or E flat. This could become extremely frustrating to us. Um, but what Dallo Piccola is doing is he's sharing this B with the RI2 row and with this row. So if we look back over here at R8, we have C, E, G, A um, in a different order, of course. But we have those four notes followed by B, E flat. So we have these four notes followed by B and then down to E flat and then that should allow us to finish those notes off. So we're actually overlapping with RI2. So with that in mind, with the R8 row, that gives us C as note number one, G as note number two, E is three, A is four, and then we're overlapping with this B as 5, coming down to D sharp or E flat, then D, G sharp or A flat, A sharp or B flat, C sharp or D flat, E sharp or F, and note number 12 in this row is F sharp or G flat, and that takes care of all of those notes. So as we wrap up this little excerpt, let me flesh out a couple things that caused us some problems. One was note repetition. 
which wasn't an issue here in this P0 row. We had a couple of note repetitions, but it was no problem. But this repetition here did stump me for a good bit. So that was one issue. And the other is this overlap, this row overlap. When we get a row overlap, we call this invariance. And in this case, we would call it vertical invariance because it's happening between um, notes within different staves. And this is a great example of vertical invariance. The other type of invariance would be linear invariance. We don't have an example of it here, but linear invariance would be if, for example, this B sharp here is uh, note number 12 in the RI2 row, but let's say it became note number one of the next row that went over to the next page and this note was shared by the RI2 and the following row as 12 in the old row and one in the new row. That would be called for, uh, linear invariance because it's in the same line of music. So we have vertical invariance and we have linear invariance and this will also come up in some of our analyses. So discovering all these rows presented several difficulties but these pieces are almost always challenging and very few of them are easy to figure out but then again these composers were not interested in us deciphering what they were doing as much as they were interested in us listening to the actual music. As you can see if you watched all four videos on 12 tone music there's a lot of work that goes into analyzing this music. I would be remiss, however, if I fail to emphasize this important point. These are pieces of music, not merely academic exercises. What we've learned to do in these four videos merely scratches the surface of the analysis that these pieces deserve. And as we analyze the music, we need ultimately to go deeper than the mere recognition of row presentations. These composers are using a method of composition, yes, but they're still composing works of art that arise from within the human spirit and contain all the musical elements as before. Pitch, timbre, melody, harmony, phrasing, motives, themes, rhythm, meter, and on and on. And I also hope that you will always listen to the music that you analyze. For as Schoenberg himself once said, my work should be judged as it enters the ears and heads of the listeners not as it is described to the eyes of the readers.